All right, folks, the goal for today is very straightforward. I've already given my predictions for week one. If you want to check that out, I will try to remember, I believe, to put it over here. Um, whole video of all my predictions for who wins and who loses for week one. But what I want to do for this episode is to look a little bit deeper into the Packers versus Vikings matchup. Um, kind of the, the way that I like to do it, as you can see, Packer fan. So there's going to be some bias. Yes, I think the Packers win. Yes, I think the Packers are the better team. If you're not okay with that, just quit now. But I feel like the the best way to approach this that isn't just biased or who wins is how does each team win? In other words, what do the Packers have to do to beat the Vikings? What do the Vikings have to do to beat the Packers? That's the way we're going to approach this. So let's take a look from that vantage point. So first of all, the Vikings are expected to win the game. Um, I have to assume a lot of that is, is home field advantage. Um, which the Vikings are very, very good at home. Didn't help them much last year in the division against the Packers and the Bears, but, you know, whatever. Um, but, I, I again, I want to kind of look at, let's start with Packers offense versus the Vikings defense. Um, I think the biggest, and, and I have to assume, again, th there's, it's hard to know when I'm being quote unquote biased and, and stepping on Vikings fans toes and when it's kind of just accepted information. Cause obviously I think all of this is, is relatively straightforward, but the loss or the, the decimation of this defensive front, um, is painful, you know, losing Hunter, losing Griffin, losing, um, Linval Joseph, whose name I forget every single time I do this, um, is painful. And you can say, well, Yannick is, is a better pass rusher than, than Everson Griffin, which I've already disagreed with and have proven statistically is not correct. But either way, the fact of the matter is Yannick Ngakwe is one of the worst run defending pass rushers in all of football, which is going to be problematic because the one bit of information we do know, or at least have been told by the Minnesota Vikings and Zimmer and whatnot, is that they're planning on putting him over to the defensive left side, which would be the Packers' right side. Um seems to be some misinformation i've seen some vikings fans saying yannick's going up against some nobody and he's going to just destroy aaron Rodgers. um he's actually going up against rick wagner because billy turner is injured rick wagner has been the right tackle for the detroit lions for several years has gone up against khalil mack and daniel hunter and zadarius smith and all these guys and has held off um much more talented people than yannick uh the other issue with that is because yannick is clearly the best pass rusher along this defensive front the packers will probably load heavy to that side which is usually the the strong side anyways the right side of the offensive line um and unfortunately for the vikings i think that's going to serve two purposes number one it's going to keep yannick away from rogers with very little regard for odenigbo going up against bakhtiari because that's a joke um but it's also going to serve as the strong side so when they run to that side You've got Yannick Ngakwe, who again is really not very good against the run, getting steamrolled to the strong side of the formation. Obviously, you've got some really talented safeties. They're not as good against the run as they are um, in coverage, but they're going to be able to come up and help. You've got Kendricks and Barr who are going to be able to help. I think the again the issue is, and it's it's sort of this this checkers, right? It's it's your move, my move. It's a counter move, counter move, move, counter move. Um, the Vikings will then probably want to bring a little extra um, strength over to that side. <sighs> Again, though, the, I, I just feel like it's a mismatch in terms of in the Packers' favor. Everything you do that way then makes you weak to the other side. Odenigbo is not a good run defender either, so they can easily go to that direction. The other really weird quirk that is um, something that I don't think anybody is super interested in Packers fans are, are not super excited about it but in this case it's going to matter is that the Packers do like to get very good run blocking wide receivers so for example you've got the strong side over here and then you've got your linebackers and safeties going to that side to I don't know if my hands are even in the thing anymore to help out Yannick and, and protect that side making this side very weak while we have Adams and let's say Lazard over to that side and Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins and Corey Lindsley and possibly a running back all blocking over to this side while your defense is over to that side. It's just, it's hard to try to compensate because you compensate, you're always going to overcompensate and leave another side weak where the Packers are strong because the fact is, as far as the offensive line, the Packers are strong from side to side. 
Um, and in the run game, there, there isn't a ton of weakness. Again, the, the wide receivers are run blockers. The tight ends are run blockers. The offensive line is, is not really, but they're good enough, especially against this defensive line. So stopping the run is going to be problematic, and I do expect the Packers to run a decent amount. Um, and another reason I think they're going to do that is there is actually a, a path to victory for the Vikings defense in terms of coverage. Um, not because I think it's advantage Vikings. I think Devontae Adams is much better than any corners you currently have. Hughes and Hill, I believe, are going to be your starters. But I think the smartest thing to do is you take your number two corner, let's say it's Hill. You put Hill on Devontae Adams and you bring some safety help. Now you've got him double teamed and it's a matter of taking your number one corner up against a guy like Alan Lazard. And now you've got, you know, what do the Packers do? Maybe Lazard can't do much against Hughes, and Adams can't do anything because he's double teamed. Now we got to lean on the tight ends, but you've got Kendricks and Barr, and as well as the remaining safety, I suppose. Um, same story with the running backs. It, it kind of creates sort of a stalemate. But again, the problem is if you take those extra resources and put them to making sure you can't throw, you're really making it weak against the run, right? Because remember, I said the, the safeties and the linebackers are going to help against the run. Well, they can't do that if they're also helping stop the tight ends, right? So there's a path there where I can see the Vikings defense having some success, trying to slow this thing down. Um, and it really is just going to be up to the Packers to kind of overcome that, right? Devontae Adams and, and especially Alan Lazard or MVS or Equinemius, whoever it is, these, these are the guys that really are going to have to step up because teams can take away Adams, especially the Vikings, you know, with, with as talented as safeties and linebackers as you have, especially again in coverage like Kendricks or whatever was phenomenal in coverage last year. You roll a little bit of extra help over there and now it's kind of like, all right, we need Lazard, we need MVS, we need Jay Sternberger, who's a second year tight end, or Josiah DeGuara, who's a rookie tight end, or somebody, Aaron Jones, somebody has to step up and help in this receiving game because the problem is, even if the Packers are really successful running the ball, you can't build a game plan unless you're the 49ers against the Packers strictly around running the football. You're going to have to be able to throw. And although generally I think that's going to be fine, the Packers found success against the Vikings before prior to losing three safeties and, and actually having pass rush, unlike you will in this game. Um, you know, with week one, no preseason, you know, you expect things to be a little iffy. And so considering this was iffy last year, I don't know that this we come out of the gate necessarily just firing all cylinders in, in the passing game. So I think the, the Vikings need to take advantage of that really early, lock down the wide receivers, say, I, I dare you to run, make sure the safeties are coming in, you know, playing real tight. The linebackers are playing real assignment. Sure. The defensive line are real assignment. Sure. Guys, get all your gaps figured out um, and just play really smart, really tight football, frustrate the offense. And then, then, well, then we got to go to the other side. But that's the path to victory that I can see for the Vikings. And it really just comes down to, to, to playing perfect, especially your really talented players need to go above and beyond. Because, again, l listen, you've got a lot of weaknesses. Rushing Aaron Rodgers is going to be very, very difficult. It just is. Containing Devontae Adams is going to be nearly impossible unless you bring extra help, which makes you weak elsewhere, right? So, it's again, it's it's really you got to count on, first of all, the Vikings defense playing way up here like better than normal because again you were 0 and 2 last year when you had much better defense in this so they have to be much better than before and we almost have to sort of count on the Packers playing poorly because I, I think if the Packers are playing really really well I don't think there's anything this defense can do I just don't um, feel free to jump in the comments and tell me where the pass rush is coming from um, where anything is coming from you know what what I, I'm trying not to go down this path but Considering we're starting from the standpoint of the Vikings were 0-2 last year, what is it that made it go like this, right? You have to prove that the Vikings got better and the Packers got worse, and I don't think either of those things happened. So that's my view of this. I, again, start hot, try to generate turnovers, whatever it is, um, and, and I don't know. I don't know how you sustain that for four quarters, but the offense is going to have to get clicking, and that's what we'll talk about now. As far as the Vikings being successful on offense, I really think it comes, I, again, I think talent is advantage Green Bay Packers. The, the defensive line up against your offensive line is, is kind of a joke, to be completely honest. Darius Smith wrecked your world last year. Kenny Clark wrecked Garrett Bradbury. 
even if Rashawn doesn't take a step, which I think he's going to, it's still a nightmare for you. Losing Stephon Diggs makes it easier for our corners. You got Jair Alexander, who's just going to be stuck on Adam Thielen, who I don't believe did very much against the Packers last year, and Jair Alexander. Ola B.C. Johnson against Kevin King, even if you don't respect Kevin King, I mean, give me a break. There isn't a ton, but... Again, especially considering this is week one, and, and I think the biggest problem with the Packers last year was not a lack of talent, but severe inconsistency. You've got guys, you know, like Jair Alexander. Oh, yeah, he's a real good corner, all this stuff. And then he'd have one game where he gives up 200 yards through the air. He's just horrible. Kenny Clark didn't get started until midway through last season, right? He was one of the better defensive linemen from, like, week 12 on. But prior to that, it's like, where, what, what is going on with him? Um, you know, Preston was up and down. Kevin King... I mean, he's, he's more down than up, but he, you know, very inconsistent. That's kind of the problem with most of the defense. I think Zadarius was fairly consistent. Amos is pretty consistent, but the rest of these guys are not. And I think for the Vikings, you've got options. You've got a talented quarterback. You've got capable tight ends. I wouldn't say they're good. Rudolph is, is on a decline and has never really been all that elite anyway. Smith, maybe he takes a jump. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. He wasn't all that productive last year. And, of course, you got Dalvin Cook and you got Adam Thielen. So at, at every level, there's there's plenty of talent. Of course, Justin Jefferson, I'm actually extremely curious as to what's going to happen there. I've heard that they're not going to put him outside, which makes sense. He seems like a strictly a, a slot guy to me when I watched him in college, and I really liked him. He reminded me of Devontae Adams a little bit um, as far as just beating everybody right off the line. The problem is he didn't do anything else outside of that. He's not a well-rounded wide receiver. He could become that, hopefully for his sake and for the Vikings fans' sake and whatnot, but... Um, at this point in time, I could absolutely understand just putting him in the slot and saying, we just want you to win off the line. He's not going to do anything down the field. Um, at least he didn't in college. I don't know. Maybe the Vikings are going to try to work out some of that stuff. But again, at every level, you got something. So I think the biggest thing is really going to be pick the thing you think is going to be most successful, probably running the football, and just hammer it. Just hammer it and hammer it. But also keep trying different stuff. Find that weakness because the Packers are – somebody's going to be doing something wrong somewhere. Somebody's having a bad day. Um, if Jair is just off, go after – just go after him. Just keep going after him. If, if the run game looks like it did against the 49ers, keep pounding that, right? I mean, last year, week two against, you know, Packers-Vikings, I don't think Dalvin Cook did all that much. On a play-to-play -play basis, you, you look at total yardage, you look at yards per carry, fine. Yeah, but he had a 75-yard run for a touchdown, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. Most of the time, he's getting two, three-yard gains. The the defensive line did a great job of just completely shutting down Cook. However, there were like three big plays from Cook. So it's really just a matter of just keep pounding it, keep pounding it, keep pounding it, and waiting for that big, like, what in the world are you doing moment from the Packers defense, right? The Detroit capitalized on that big time, right out of the gate, deep shot right over Kevin King's head. What in the world is he doing? But that's how, especially when we're talking about early in the season, it's probably not going to be a high-scoring game. Pick your spots, right? Like boxing. You're throwing the jab, throwing the jab, just waiting to throw that haymaker and knock him out. That's the best-case scenario I can see for the Minnesota Vikings. On top of that, I think the Packers are going to be real aggressive. They know the advantage they have with Zedarius and with Kenny Clark and with Preston and with, um, they, you know, whether you believe it or not, they're really, really high on Rashawn Gary and, and his athletic upside and ability. They're going to come after this offensive line. They're going to come after Kirk Cousins. They're coming real hot. So if you can kind of shift the offense a little bit, I know Kirk Cousins held onto the ball, I think, longer than anybody in football last year. A lot of that maybe is play action, but it doesn't matter. Bottom line is the longer you hold onto the ball, the more advantageous it is for the Packers defensive line. I think that's a big part of the reason they were so successful at getting to Cousins last year. Not only is the offensive line bad, but when you're holding the ball as long as you are, it just gives them more time. It's common sense. Getting away from Stephon Diggs, who is a downfield threat, moving toward Justin Jefferson, who is a boom, off the line, he's open kind of guy, and Thielen is a little shaky, shifty kind of guy. Um, the, the tight ends are more, you know, close to the line of scrimmage. I think if we can shift toward that, run the ball, run the ball, get the outside zone going, dink and dunk the ball, take out, you're neutralizing the pass rush. You don't need a great offensive line if the ball's coming out in, you know, 1.98 seconds. Nobody in the world is getting to the quarterback that fast. It doesn't matter how talented they are. So we're going to run the ball a lot. We're going to throw the ball kind of short dink and dunk stuff. And on top of that, as I mentioned in the podcast, if you want to hear more about this Packernet podcast, uh, I did this today. It's today's episode looking at all this stuff. But it also helps your defense, right? As much as we can say the Packers offense is, is ahead of the Vikings defense, as much as I would say that, you can't score if you don't have the ball. 
And if we can keep it close, you know, if, if the Packers touch the ball twice before halftime, which is unlikely, but let's just say because the Vikings are holding on for a very long time, Packers have sustained drives. And let's just say it's a nightmare scenario. The Vikings have been terrible for the most part, and it's they the Packers got touchdowns on both of those drives. At halftime, it's 14-0. It's still manageable because the offense is doing a good job of sustaining these drives. Even if you're not scoring, whatever, we're keeping it close. And I think that's going to be important as well because, again, you pick your spots, you wait for the Packers to just shoot themselves right in the foot make a stupid mistake and you got somebody deep down the field you get that touchdown and suddenly it's 7 to 14 here come the vikings out of halftime this isn't a prediction i'm just giving you an example um and that's going to keep you guys in the fight um you know and again this the prediction doesn't mean anything and even if even if i think the packers have a better roster that that still puts it at like 54 percent to, to 46 percent i think i said 54 i forgot it's hard to do math when you forget the number you just said um, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough game. It's going to be tight, especially with no preseason. Um, as much as we get hyped up about, oh man, Zadarius is going to wreck this and all this stuff. You, the Packers are going to come out and do something stupid right out of the gate. The, pa- the Vikings are going to score and we're all going to slouch in our chair and start crying, right? That's just how football works. Same with Vikings fans. We all build this stuff up in our mind about how great we're going to be. And then you watch real life where guys struggle and people are making stupid mistakes and Riley Reef is going to jump off sides and Kirk Cousins is going to throw a pick and, and you know, Kenny Clark's going to hurt his knee in the second game snap of the game. And it's just, you see all the fantasy just drift away, right? So, I look, I think it's going to be a good game. Um, score prediction, I don't know. Give me a minute to think about it. I'll come back in the next segment here and, and look at work on that. I don't like doing that, but we should probably do it. But um, I do think it's advantage Packers. I, I really think it comes down to this This is where it's at, right? Packers are here. Vikings are here. And a lot of it does have to, you know, when Hunter comes back, it, it bumps up quite a bit. But that's a that's a serious problem. If, if this was Daniil Hunter going up against Rick Wagner, assuming, because we think Billy Turner's injured, whatever. I'm assuming that's who it is. If, if that was the matchup, but also we have Yannick on the other side, it just automatically creates a different dynamic. So things like that will shift, and that's obviously going to be, you know, when we face you guys again next time, there'll be another another thing to look at. But um, I, I, I think as of right now, the Packers are here, the Vikings are here. I don't care what the line is set at or whatever. So it's a matter of as long as the Packers don't do this, uh, they should be fine, right? Even if the Vikings are playing well above, I think the Packers are just good enough that if, if they can play just smart football don't make stupid mistakes don't miss tackles don't throw interceptions don't whatever they'll be fine the vikings on the other hand i think have to play a little bit above and beyond which is which is doable right they have the the high octane ability the safeties are so freakishly talented that they can they can wreck a game right um you got guys like cousins and thielen and Cook, that can absolutely blow open a game like that. We saw it week two last year. One, the Packers defense just stopping them, stopping them, stopping them, stopping them. They can't do anything, and then boom, 75-yard touchdown. Guess what? Game is basically tied right now, right? So that's, I guess that's kind of where I'm at. I I, I think it's advantage Packers, um, which I think is is the more smart thing to say as, as opposed to a prediction because the advantage can shift based on so many random variables but i do think the the packers are currently the more talented roster they've had less fluctuations less loss probably more growth than the vikings um but i do think it's going to be a close game let's let's break here and let me think about a prediction here so again these these predictions are are more or less useless but i'm looking at last year week two when everybody was more or less healthy I'll, I'll disregard the second game where we stomped you out by 13 points in your home stadium um the packers won by five points it was a much closer game um and i am gonna actually say the score was lower even though this is a really low score i'm gonna go a little bit lower which is actually gonna make it even a little bit closer um I just, I mean, it, it kind of goes against my conventional wisdom in which, you know, the, the Packers should be able to drive down and score, and the Vikings will probably get some touchdowns. But I just, I feel like it's going to be a sloppy game in which the Packers and Vikings both, regardless of who wins, look at that and go, we're, we're in trouble, right? Because that's just, that's week one in general that always happens. Plus, again, no preseason and all that. I'm just expecting a, a slop fest. I'm going to go a little bit closer to like 13-16. Um, which obviously denotes a lot of field goals and not as much touchdowns, which 
maybe it will be a little bit more touchdowns because the defense is a little bit more sloppy. But um, I don't know. I, I, I just see this not being great. Again, I don't care too much about predictions, but just to give you a general idea where my head's at, I'm going to say 13 to 16 Packers win. Anyways, guys, uh, please, if you wouldn't mind checking out the week one predictions, that'll give you the more full, broad uh, view of all my picks for this week. If you do like this, I'm still trying to play it, playing around with what people like and don't like or whatever, please hit the uh, like button so that I know to do more of this type of stuff. Um, if not, then don't do that. Otherwise, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell notification so you don't miss any episodes. We're going to be doing some mock drafty stuff. I promise I haven't forgot about that. It's just not the right time. Nobody cares about mock drafts when we're about to start week one of the regular season. What I'll probably do, actually, is wait to see what happens. We'll obviously have a really messed up order, a draft order, and I'm just going to use that for fun, and we'll do a mock draft off of that. Um, but anyways, please, uh, again, subscribe to the channel. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time.